Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Jacob O from Singapore. Dr. O is a senior consultant and deputy head at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Tantaxin Hospital, Singapore. He's also the chief of spine service in Tantaxin. Having graduated from New Zealand in 2003, he did his orthopedic residency in Singapore and later traveled to Canada for a fellowship in complex spine surgery. His current practice focuses exclusively on spinal surgery with special interest in adult spinal deformity, spinal navigation, and robotics, and MIS. Dr. Jacobs serves on the executive committee of the Singapore Spine Society, Asian MIST, and is also the current AO Spine Chairperson from Singapore. Dr. O has published in more than 50 peer-reviewed journals and has won numerous awards for his contributions in clinical work and teaching. Most recently, 2021, he received the Tantoxin Hospital Top 10 Best Teacher Award and also the National University of Singapore Dean's Award for Teaching Excellence. So today is my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Jacob O from Singapore. Over to you, Jake. Yeah, thanks a lot, Hitesh, for your kind introduction and it's truly an honor and really excited to be here. Look, I've been um, doing lateral surgery for about 10 years and each time I do it, I get excited and I really enjoy this procedure. I feel it's the right procedure to do, not because uh, it's comfortable for the surgeon, but also the patients, they do pretty well. So over the next 30 minutes, uh, I really hope that I can share some of my, my knowledge that I've accumulated over the past few years. And hopefully this will help you in your spine practice over the coming years. So let's first talk about the lateral lumbar interbody fusion, which started off with the x lift and uh, l lift, some people will call it. And this um, went through the, the psoas approach, trans psoas, and it had all the benefits of interior fusion and more. It had biomechanical stability by having a large, tall cage with good fusion rates. It could correct deformity very well, not only in the sagittal plane, but also in the coronal plane. And really, the the best part about the, this X-lift or D-lift that people called was the indirect knee compression. You didn't have to do a laminectomy. There was no dural retraction. You never have a CSF leak. And it was great for revision cases. And you could do multi-level MIS fusions um, after that just by putting percutaneous screws. But there was a problem. There was a lot of complications from the trans source approach or side effects, I would say, because when you went through the source muscle, you get definitely some patients having some motor deficits, sensory deficits, or just thigh pain and groin pain. And because you're going through a direct lateral position, the crest is very high in that position. So it's not always possible to access this area. So why not avoid this entirely? And that's when the pioneer for this procedure, the Olive procedure, uh, was created by Rick Hines. And so he said, hey, why not we just go in front of the psoas muscle because there's a nice bare corridor over there just before the great vessels. And so he actually came down in, to Singapore in 2016 and I and convinced me to switch from a trans psoas approach to the olive approach. So I've been doing that for almost six years now. And the benefits were immediate. And no patients with having uh, any problems with uh, the uh, issues with lump, the nerve injury from the lumbar plexus. Uh, no less thigh pain from my patients. You do not need neuromonitoring. And the eyelid crest seldom became an issue. So I'm going to go through the OLIF L2 to 5. Now, L2 to 5 and OLIF, uh, OLIF 5 1 are two different procedures. L2 to 5, I'll talk about the key steps, what the books would say. And then after that, I'll talk about some of, I'll bring you into the OT and show you some uh, real images and, and live video on how things actually work uh, in, in the surgery itself. So this picture on your right is something that you're going to see a lot in the textbooks, okay? We're talking about pre-op planning. And they'll say, if you find a bare corridor at this area, you can do the olive. But I'll tell you, there are actually three things to look out for. The first one, of course, is there a corridor? But the second thing you need to look out for, especially when you're starting out, is how bulky the source is, okay? And the third thing is, will the crest get in your way? Let me explain this. So if you look at this um, axial cut of an MRI scan, is this a good case to start off with? Yes, because there's a nice bare area and the source is not very bulky. But what about this case? Bad case to start off with because there is no corridor. You can see the vessels and the source are very close to each other. 
And how about this picture on the right? Now that's not a great case as well for, for beginners because it's a very bulky psoas. And you realize if you've got a bulky psoas, you, the first structure that you may encounter when you get past the anterior margin of the psoas, it's actually the great vessels. So it's better sometimes to get to look for the cases where, for example, an L34 where the psoas is not too big. And we published this in our um, journal publication in the spine journal about the oblique corridor at L45. So, and, and this highlighted some of the problems with having a very bulky psoas and we graded them. And I'll say a picture on the left says, these are the good cases to start off with, but pick cases on the right, these are not great cases to start off with. Something that we should recognize just as um, before you start off your olive career. Um, the other thing you need to pay attention is also the ribs and the eyelid crest and the concavity and the convexity of the, the spine. Take a look at this L45 disc, okay? If you always approach from the left using the, um, with the olive, you realize that the crest will get into your way, okay, on, on the left side. So take note of these kind of um, structures because if the crest is in the way, you can still perform the procedure. However, you will notice that your instruments will be um, heading towards the end plate of L5, for example. You can still work through it. The solution is to use angle instruments, but starting off as uh, doing the olive might be a bit more tricky um, doing so. So easier if you find a crest that's not so high. But sometimes it's not suitable for all cases to use the olive, and sometimes you just have to use the transverse approach. For example, picture on the left, okay, you've got a very high eyelid crest, the, and you can see the red lines will show you if you're going to do an olive approach from the left, you can see the uh, eyelid crest will get into the way. And also the incision will be very large. That's when the X lift or D lift will be more appropriate. Okay. And if you have a very narrow corridor, the picture on the right and a bulky psoas, it will be very, very difficult to get to the disc space as well. Now let's bring you to the OR. When you position a patient, that's very important. Always left side up. Okay. I put a pillow between the legs and I tape the patient, extend the legs, and also tape the patient in three areas, the shoulders, the eyelid crest, and also the legs. The next thing you want to do is get the C-arm in and make sure before you start that you're having a the patient is placed in a true lateral position. And how do you make sure that is done? First of all, step one, the picture on the right, top right, is you take an x-ray and the AP view first. Now you orientate yourself, make sure you see the two pedicles very clearly and the spinous process in the middle. Then you know you're having a true AP. If you're off, make sure you move the bed or the patient, but not the floral. And if you have scoliosis, your patient with a severe scoliosis, you may have to readjust the table at each level um, during the surgery itself. The second step you do now that you know your patient is based in a true, the AP, it's a true AP, you swing the C arm 90 degrees perpendicular to the floor, and then you will get a perfect lateral view, okay, or true lateral view. This is what you see on the, the picture on the bottom right, and, and, and then you'll start to do your skin marking. Now, why is it important that you pay, place the patient in a true lateral position? Well, because most of the time when you're putting your cage, you think the patient is true lateral and you will place your cage parallel to the long axis of the disc like so. Okay, because when you're doing the orthogonal maneuver, you must place your cage directly perpendicular um, to, to the floor, you see? But if you're slightly rotated, what's gonna happen is that you would think you're placing the cage um, in an orthogonal fashion. However, the patient's rotated, you might hit the nerve root instead. Or worse so, if it's rotated the other way, you might hit the great vessels. Once you're in the true lateral position, then you can mark the disc space like so. So you wanna mark the middle of the disc space, the anterior border and the posterior disc space. From there, you will mark an incision, which is about three to five centimeters anterior to the middle of the disc. Then you will um, start your dissection down to the psoas. Okay, first, and this you'll see this in the books. First, you cut skin, subcutaneous tissue, and then the three layers of the abdominal muscles, namely an external oblique, internal oblique, and the transversalis fascia. Then you get down to the retroperitoneal space. You will see the fat. I always tend to aim a little bit posterior. The first thing that I was worried about is, am I going to cause a peritoneal breach? 
So to, so to prevent that from happening, once I, I see the peritoneal space, okay, transverse size fascia, I just undermine it slightly further posteriorly, and then I put my finger all the way to the back. So, okay, so the more posterior, the safer you are. Okay, then you walk along, then you then you peel off the retroperitoneal fat, and you see the um, psoas muscle muscle. Once you see the psoas muscle, you're kind of home free because that's that's your that's your lighthouse. Okay. And then you trace the psoas to the anterior margin of the psoas, okay? And then you should see the disc space. And under direct vision, you can put your wires inside the disc space and you're actually very safe. The next step you do, you uh, um, place the retractors inside by sequential dil uh, dilation. And this is a critical, critical step. You want to place the retractors and the blade parallel to the disc space because when you open up your retractors, okay, because you're going to work out of the retractors and that's the essence of the olive procedure. Okay. And, where, and when you dock your retractor, you also want to make sure you're in the middle of the disc space. Okay. The, it's important because if your retractor is too posterior, well, you get less lordosis, although you do get more indirect decompression. If it's too far interior, okay, you will get a lot of lordosis, okay, but less indirect decompression. So know what your aims are. If you're planning for indirect decompression and just putting percutaneous screws at the back, you may want to put it in the middle or slightly posterior. But if it's a deformity correction case, then you want to put it all the way to the front. Okay. And this is the essence of the only procedure, the orthogonal maneuver. And to describe his moving instrument from oblique to a direct lateral position. So the approach I always tell my residents is oblique, but you're know, putting the cage in again is directly in line with the long axis of the disc, which is direct, direct lateral, like so. And you can see here my tube picture on the left, my tube is oblique, but all my instruments, okay, are working directly down to the floor, okay. Now it's very important that you don't skype anteriorly or posteriorly, so always aim directly down, 90 degrees to the floor, okay? Now we've talked about the key steps. Now let's look at the case illustration with images and video. Okay, this is a 56 year old female with diagnosis of uh, spinal stenosis. Okay, she's got a flat back and she's low dose is about 21 degrees. You can see there's a slight coronal bend as well. Okay, and stenosis at multiple levels, namely 2, 3, 3.45. What I want to press on you, there's a pretty good corridor. And if you're a lateral surgeon, first thing you think about, can I do uh, this case using a, a lateral procedure? Okay. And so this is what I did. Okay, I did a stage one olive approach, L2 to 5, and a stage two percutaneous MI screws, L2 to 5, all in, all in one day. So the first thing I do, again, a patient is placed on the left side up, lateral position. The C arm comes in, okay, and I start with a true AP, okay. Once I get a true AP, C arm swings 90 degrees, and I get a true lateral, and now I'm ready to mark the patient, do a skin marking. These are my skin markings. Okay, in the middle of the disc, anterior border of the disc, I mark three centimeters from the front of the disc space. And this is my incision. I tend to make, uh, if I'm doing multiple levels, I tend to make it a little bit more bleak because it's extensile. In L23, I do tend to make it close to midline because the psoas bulk is not so thick as compared to L45. Okay, so that's a skin incision. And that's after the skin is inside, so you see the external oblique fascia. Okay, uh, in external oblique fascia is one in blue and internal oblique. Uh, fascia is split, muscle is split in yellow, sorry, in orange. And there's a transverse salis fascia. And now you see the retroperitoneal fat. Okay. And after you see the retroperitoneal fat, you sweep everything away to expose the anterior border of the psoas to look for the oblique corridor. And you can see everything is under direct visualization. So you're very sure you're not, nothing is blind. Okay. So the concern of getting a peritoneal injury is actually not very high because you're seeing all the instruments that's going in. And you can actually, if you look for it, you don't normally see it, but if you hunt for it, you can actually see, especially L34, that's the ureter where the, the blue arrow is pointing towards, but it, which is typically stuck to the retroperitoneal fat. 
So you don't normally see it, but if you hunt for it, you may find it. Okay, that's the disk space. It's usually glistening white. Okay, and I put a Y inside down there, and I put my dilators. Okay, and the retractor comes in. And I'm going to show you the video right now. The skin incision is made through the muscle layers. Sometimes you will see small nerve fibers running across, just mobilize them away. Okay, and you can see that's the retroperitoneal fat. Okay, and I'm pulling the fat, I, I aim posteriorly and I pull all the fat anteriorly, right? Because I'm worried, I don't want to get a peritoneal breach, okay? And you see all these fat over there. And then you just sweep everything forward, okay? And you'll see that muscle bulk. It's the first thing you see directly in front of you. It's going to be the psoas, okay? And when you see the psoas, don't stop there. What's important is you clear the psoas, okay? And sweep all the retroperitoneal fat caudally and cranially away as much as possible. You can see, I can see the anterior border. I'm sweeping on the fat caudally away and then I, I will aim up to sweep all the um, retroperitoneal fat away as well. The reason why is because when I put my retractors in, I don't want any of the peritoneal structures to creep into my surgical field. So <clears throat> really dissect it, generous dissection of all the fat away from the surgical site. Then I feel the psoas and I put these lip retractors and I retract the psoas away and I can see the disk space here nicely, all under vision. There we go. And so the next thing, um, I will perform my discectomy. And I usually start the corpse because it's more efficient. I walk on the end plates and I can, after that, I can use the curettes, pit rongers, and the first cage is in and I'm walking on the um, end plates below. Again, I usually use a straight cop for the level below and a curved cop for the level above because of the concavity of the vertebra above, right? Put the second cage in, and then I look for the third level. Okay, osteophytes, you can just bite it off. Okay, and put the last cage inside. Okay, the discectomy looks something like this put your cages in, and three cages through a small incision, uh, you can see all done quite nicely. I'm reflecting the psoas backwards. And I fill it the patient prone and I bring in the robot. For this case, I do a, some pre-op planning from L2 to L5, okay? And I put the screws percutaneously, all MIS, and this is the final outcome. And you can see that she's got, <clears throat> she did pretty well. Her leg pain was resolved and it started physio on day two and was discharged on day four. So that's how you do the olive, guys. But I'll say that this is really just the beginning. And the reason why I say that is because once you have adopted lateral surgery, you know, it's just like a tip of the iceberg. There's so much more possibilities that you can do with this uh, procedure. And, and your armamentarium as a spine student really increases by leaps and bounds. That's how I, how I felt. Like you're comfortable dealing with revision cases like adjacent level degeneration because you can just put in a cage and you can do an indirect decompression. You don't have to deal with so much of the scar tissue. Um, you can do multi-level MI fusions like the case I, I spoke to you about. You can, and I'll, I'll show you some cases like MI scopectomy, single position surgery, and even long constructs for deformity cases. And I think really these are the things that people will start referring you to cases because you know you have this uh, technical abilities to tackle it. Let's talk about MI scopectomy. Most of the time, I go posterior. But in some cases, you know, they just need anterior column support. And in the past, you do a long incision, like a torical lumbar incision, you know, like a shark bite, they call it. <clears throat> but now you don't have to. For example, or even this lady who's got a pathological fracture at L4 and with a retropulse fragments, she's got a foot drop. Um, and so what I did, I did, I did a 5 cm oblique incision, okay? 
And again, the Olive procedure, and I did my discectomies first, L3-4 and L4-5. Remember, this is an L4 pathological fracture. Okay, I take an osteotome to remove the bone. That's for my corpectomy. And that's my corpectomy done. That's a corpectomy defect. You can see the gauze inside down there, I'm packing it up, okay? But what I'm trying to achieve now, I'm trying to do a decompression. So that um, yellow arrow over here is the pedicle. So a corpectomy is done. Now I'm going to do a formal decompression. And you can see, I can see the thecal sac very nicely and even the extinct nerve root. And I reconstruct that with an expandable cage. And this is the outcome. She has, um, she did well, post-op day one, she's able to mobilize and uh, it's a nice reconstruction over there. And I put MIS, percutaneous eyelid screws as well. Next thing you can do is uh, people talk about, first of all, I first started with a direct uh, uh, transverse approach, like a D-lift, then I did an O-lift. And what's the next evolution for the O-lift? It's single position surgery because a lot of hesitation is, is the, the problem with flipping the patient. So, when you have no flip, it really saves time. And, and because you can harness the power of indirect decompression, you don't have to do a physical decompression. So you can actually just put percutaneous screws from the side, and your operation is done. And the two ways to do it, you can either use navigation or the robotics. And I've transitioned a little bit more to robotics right now. You can see over here, the patient's placed in a lateral position, the robot is down here. And while my resident is closing up, I'm putting the percutaneous reference screw pin and it's, it's wonderful, right? Because if you use uh, navigation or the um, O-arm, you've got to stand up to knock in the screws when you're looking at the S8 or S7. But if you use a robot, the robot just brings you to where you want to, want to go because you do pre-op planning before this. And you can see this picture on the right. So I'm sitting down and this picture on the right shows you a virtual image of the screw. This is navigation, robotic navigation. And it tells you, and you pre-op, you're planning where your screw wants to go and it just takes you there the robotic arm takes you to the exact position with great accuracy and tells you your depth, how much to go. All the screws are loaded up in advance. So you just sit down there and put in the screw. I hopefully this video works. Okay, so the first screw is in. A robot will take me to the second screw. And that's it. I just sit down there and chat with my, uh, my anesthetist, you know, and when the robot says, Put in the screws, I just do, do it. So it's really easy. Yeah, and all together the screws, no KYS, takes about three minutes per screw. And that's, you can see the picture on the left, that's how we pre-op planned, how we want the screws to go in, and that's the final result. And lastly, I'll say, this is the, uh, another great thing about the, the Olive approach. You, you will inherently be taking a lot of spinal deformity cases because when you look at it, you know you can great, create sagittal deformity correction with the, with the lateral approach. You, you know you're going to get great correction for the coronal approach. And I've done, because of the O-lifts, I've done so much, so many more, so, so much less PSOs um, over the past few years. Okay. And there's also option in long deformity cases to stage my procedures, especially for the elderly cases. And the best part, indirect decompression again, I don't have any problems with non-union, no have problems with subsidence, cage backouts, CSF leaks. We, you know, it's a bad day when that happens. Again, you can see the power of uh, the lateral, just opening up, breaking the osteophytes in a, in a very semi-fused disc space over here that's very rigid. Okay, the trials and the cages go in. You can put the cage all the way as interior as possible for good low doses. And that's the final outcome over here. All in all, I would like to conclude that um, we spoke about the benefits of the OLIF approach, um, the L2, the L5, the key steps, the surgical technique. Look in the pre-op assessment, three key structures to look at, the crest, like the vessels and the psoas, the positioning, what's how it, the true lateral position is so important. Exposure, have a direct look. The discectomy, make sure you know where to put your cage in for, um, for either lordosis or indirect decompression. And we talked about orthogonal maneuver. But most importantly, we spoke about what the olive approach will unlock if you, if you master this technique, such as MIS, copectomies, uh, single prison surgery, and deformity. And with that, I want to thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. 
Thank you, Jake, for that fabulous presentation. And congratulations for the absolutely brilliant work that you're doing at Tank Talk Center. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. A couple of questions from our side. Uh, now, it, what do you use for all of us? You can actually stop sharing. There's an option to stop share at the bottom. Yeah. So, Jake, uh, you use a blade based retractor system, right? For the OLF, it's a slightly larger incision. So, do you think if we go using an X lift, for example, a 360, you can use a tube based retractors and really do an MIS? Well, you see, those, um, the, the X lift and the OLIF retractor, they're pretty much the same. They're like a blade or tube. tube. It's just the, the question is how much you want to open it up. I think for those cases, for the copectomy and a tree level, I open up a little bit more just to illustrate it. But usually you don't really have to open it up more than uh, three to five centimeters in the incision. But you're right. If you have what single, if it's, if it's just a single level, the small incision, the sexier it becomes. And do you think there's an issue with orientation when you do an olive compared to a lateral one, you're going in a slightly oblique way, right? So you think there could be an issue with orientation if someone is already doing the uh, lateral one and is shifting to oblique. Yeah, I mean, that's a great a great thing. You know, uh, you come in oblique and then you're wondering, okay, how do I um, interpret where my x-ray is? Actually, the x-ray looks exactly the same. The final x-ray looks the same as uh, the olive x-ray, the implants looks exactly the same as the x lift or d lift looks exactly the same. But it does help initially to start off doing a direct lateral because you, you understand that, uh, how a, um, what a, a, a true lateral, your instrumentation, how it's going orthogonal to start off with. Actually, my, when, once my retractor goes in obliquely, I don't actually, I, I do my orthogonal maneuver at the start. It means I do my anilotomy and everything goes in straight down, um, just like an x lift straight away so that's besides the approach everything else is really a direct lateral yeah thank you jake for that and uh, what about the uh, complications when you compare i mean very commonly the comparison comes with yes. the x lift and uh, i mean a lift and p lift people are quite well versed and these are the two trending procedures right yes x lift versus o lift yeah and uh, if you look at the complications for example hip flexion weakness or what, what have been your experience uh, is there a neurological issue and what is the peritoneal irritation causing paralytic ileus? Okay. So I will tell you, I had a lot of hesitations starting off from a direct lateral, uh, from, from direct lateral first or X-lift and then moving to o -lift. My biggest concern was that, hey, I'm an autopod. I can't salvage any peritoneal injury. I can't salvage any um, vascular injury. Very clear cut. So I'm quite happy if uh, patients has a bit of uh, thigh pain through going to the source. I, I thought I was quite happy with that. But as, as things evolved, uh, the, the thigh pain for the x lift was a problem because um, it lasted for quite a, a long time. So after trying the OLIF once, twice, then several times, 10 times, you realize that actually patients don't really have much thigh pain at all. And it's actually not so easy to, I've done, even in my early days, earlier, like when I first started out, so far, I haven't had touch with any peritoneal injuries, no vascular injuries as well. So for 2.5, it's actually quite safe. Yeah. And two really the, the, the thigh pain and the, I'm not worried because everybody talked about uh, the x lift or the d lift that you one day, you what if you wake up, you hit, <clears throat> patient wakes up, they hit a femoral nerve. And it might be a disastrous thing, but you're not worried about that, the, the o lift. Yeah. So you can quite they, commonly, yeah. Yeah. I think the advantage is a slightly larger incision and you can see everything much clearer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. My incisions that I show you was a little bit bigger for, for illustrations. Love. But, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's a direct look. You're right. It's a direct look. It's a, it's a, it's a less invasive. Love. I wouldn't say it's completely keyhole. It's not blind, right? It's not, it's not a blind. It's really seeing it and you're reflecting it. And there's a le much less radiation. So I'll make my incision and I'll reflect the source. I put my wire in, I put the retractors in and my first x-ray, okay, when I'm gowned up would be a localization to see where is my tube and I'm an alpha and I'm doing the discectomy already. As opposed to an x-lift or d-lift, I need to use that probe to find out whether I'm in the middle of this. It's just like an IM nail, right? Getting the right spot. Yeah, so there's a lot more um, radiation.
Thank you, Jake. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for this fantastic talk. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you Thank so much you. for joining. Jake. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Hitesh. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.